Good people. It's a word we hear often, a phrase, but why does it matter? What does it even mean? You know, about three years ago, I embarked on a project to start exploring and traveling across the country and then across the globe to start asking people what that simple question meant, good people. And I did it for a couple reasons. First, I've, I've been really blessed to actually be very, very happy with every career I've had. Um, I've actually enjoyed doing everything from technology startups to being part of one of the largest media transformations with my partner and leading Thomson Reuters over 10 years. And then starting everything from a nail salon that I'll talk about to now trying to change the model for VC. But every single step in any modicum of success I've enjoyed has really just come through the gift of a set of good people. But when I asked this, the answers I got confused me. I never got clarity on what it meant. We so often define goodness by competency and so rarely define it by character and values. And there's a hard truth to these soft matters I learned in going and journeying around um, the globe to understand good people. And why should it matter is because of the following. We are in a 17-year-old rut in institutional trust across media, NGOs, companies, um, our, our startups, across every major institution, 17 years, it's the first time all four lack institutional trust. Employee engagement, a measure of how happy people are supposed to be at work. We're all part of digital companies. Everyone's supposed to be happy. 10 years, the average is about 32%. Two thirds of people are indifferent or want to leave their job. And then we just think it's normal to have a scandal every year, a WorldCom, an Enron, a Theranos, a Samsung, and culturally, an American, a Delta, an Uber, it's just acceptable now. I didn't think it was, and so I started exploring this question because I believe we're at a crisis and crossroads in leadership. And so I looked at people and I said, Sheryl Sandberg, John Wooden, the famed UCLA coach, Tony Shea, Neri Oxman of the MIT Media Lab, Herbie Hancock, 14 Grammys. Henry McCants, my own mentor, chairman of Greylock, 45 years. What did all these people really have in common? It turns out that goodness has to be something far greater than competency. Goodness is about character. I spent a lot of time with the dean of Harvard Business School when doing this, and he said, as an institution, that is meant to educate a next generation of leaders. We've been so long on teaching competency and skills and so short on trying to see if we can even cultivate values and character. And I said, well, what does that really mean when you can do that? And the definition that we came to is that real goodness and real leadership is when you help others become a fuller version of who they are. Another way of putting it, the greatest leaders I've met and people like the ones I showed, they're not leaders trying to produce followers. They're, in Tom Peters' words, leaders who are trying to produce other leaders. And so we tried to unpack the words that could define goodness, and define goodness especially in leadership. And it was surprising, again, that we can seem to better define a wine by its fruit, wood, and earth than we could about the characteristics of goodness. Marvin Minsky, my, my neighbor, um, my late neighbor, said to me as I was going through this project, goodness has become such a suitcase word. We've put so much in it, it's lost any meaning. How do we unpack it to its values? So what do these people have in common? Three cornerstone values. And we need them in the digital age. Truth. What is truth? Truth begins with the mindset of humility, of believing that you actually have weaknesses, that you can learn. Then it moves to the most critical leadership trait, as Jim Collins put forth, of self-awareness. Self-awareness is about a consistency in how we act with our integrity, knowing our biases, 
but acting with integrity means self-congruence. What does that mean? It means that we actually do what we say, we actually say what we think, and we actually think what we feel, and understand that what we feel is actually who we are. Only with this foundation of truth can you have a capacity for compassion. I'm putting forth a thesis that more important than ever in an age of technology, as Sherry Turco said, where we're increasingly alone together, we need increasingly the human factor of compassion. And that begins with a mindset that is open. It moves to actual practice of empathy, to transpose yourself into the feelings of another as if they were your own feelings, and ultimately to act with generosity. Leadership is a privilege. It's a privilege to serve in a leadership role. And ultimately, what I found in 100 case studies that we looked at, and by the way, in these 100 case studies, they performed better. Yes, shareholder value was created stronger, and compassion and competition were not at odds. One of the greatest examples, it wasn't a Facebook, it wasn't an Apple, it was a company out in San Diego that put stuff in blue and yellow cans called WD-40. 98% of employees at WD-40 would recommend it for their family, friends, or other people to work there. And 20-year record of great shareholder value creation because they believe in a philosophy that is, help me get an A, don't just mark my paper. And that is their redefinition of success, wholeness. What's the difference between wholeness? So often in this startup world and this current culture, it is about winning and losing. It is binary. We must dominate that market. It's all or nothing, network effect. Wholeness is what John Wooden, that famed UCL basketball coach said, I have been a part of teams that have outscored other teams and felt like I have lost. And I've been at times where other teams outscored mine and I felt like we have won. The greatest times are when we both walk off the court and we don't know who won or lost. Wholeness is a journey, asymptotic, towards doing the best to which we are capable towards that higher calling and purpose. And yes, it involves love, which should be a word we introduce in business and startups, respect, and ultimately to act with a level of wisdom. But why is this so hard? Whether you believe these are words or not, why is practicing goodness in leadership so damn difficult? It turns out, in my research that I've found, that we are almost hardwired against goodness. We have cognitive biases that prevent us from being good. In every startup, in every business journey, we're on this almost tandem dance, a, a sort of tango which is poetic, fluid, and, and, and full of poetry on one side, yet architecturally stiff and structured and staccato on the other. And what are some of these tensions that we face? Pragmatism versus idealism. Having grit versus knowing when to have acceptance. Our vulnerability versus our conviction. Being idiosyncratic and out there. You know, Tony Shea's famous interview question, on a scale of one to 10, how weird are you? We need people who are just weird enough while still having connectivity. And perhaps the hardest one is balancing our short-term bias versus long-term. So let me dive into two briefly. Vulnerability versus conviction. The paradox of entrepreneurship for me is that we walk this tightrope between vulnerability and conviction. Vulnerability and risk-taking are actually euphemisms for one another. Risk-taking is just a fancy MBA word for taking active, active charge of your vulnerability. And what about conviction? Conviction, conviction is about having that calling, that purpose, and ability to articulate it in a way that inspires with your group. On one hand, we need to have the humanity through our vulnerability. On the other hand, we have to show our strength through our conviction. What you see here is an image that appeared in the New York Times about two years ago by, a, by Sarah Maslin-Nair's expose on nail salons in New York City. 10 years ago, after my partners and I had done two 
startups. I've worked with my partners for a long time. The one I know the least, I've worked with for 16 years. The one I know the longest, I've worked together with for 30 years. We decided it made perfect sense after doing a big data play, after doing an interactive media company, and after having a chance to, um, my other partner ran, uh, Thompson, for 10 years, led the largest media transformation, that clearly the best next step for us was to start a nail salon. So a decade ago, we decided what would happen if you actually applied technology, human kindness, character, a sense of dignity to the nail salon industry. We saw what Sarah saw. We traveled the country, talked to hundreds of nail technicians, and saw the human exploitation in an industry that employs approximately 400,000 women. When people ask me today, I was at a, an, another um, group last night in DC, they said, what are you most proud of? You've, you've, you've had a chance to do a lot of different experiences since the earliest days of commercialization of the internet. I say I'm most proud of the thousand women we now employ here, the 25 studios, the fact that we and, and my partners as men understand that this is not just a beauty service, it's a moment of self-care, self-expression, self-confidence. It's a moment of yay for the client. It's understanding that when I met a woman who said it was the first time she had a manicure, I said, why? And she trembled and almost cried in front of me and said, because I have a job interview and I'm a single mom and this is just giving me a bit of confidence, thank you. So what would happen if we had surgical grade hygiene? We use big data to find out if you're oval, squoval, short, medium, long, pink ballerina, Gucci Pucci, if we understood that there's correlation between the weather and demand and match supply and demand through algorithms. Well, it turns out we've built this um, studio into a model that does more sales per square feet now than Neiman Marcus and has about $50 million of funding of which we have placed the vast majority. And we believe that this will be one of our uh, businesses that is the greatest one that we have built over 20 years. But vulnerability and conviction, when we went out there, imagine three guys in the middle of the economic crisis explaining to investors the difference between a Manny and a Petty. This is the problem when you have a male-dominated VC industry. And that's why we've become very proud to support a lot of women-led, for women ventures. Now what about short-term versus long-term? This is perhaps the greatest cognitive bias to fight against. We are hardwired against goodness because we have present day bias, what behavioral economists call um, hyperbolic discounting. We go out there and we have an inability to really act long term. We have a great ability to think long term, but we act every second like a sprint and not the marathon of life. We have long term problems, long term opportunities, but yet, we can't control our present day bias. It's why we can't go through diets. We can't stop smoking. It's why people can't retire properly because we have a present day bias. So how can we get around short term versus long term? Because of this bias, we elected at my firm for funding startups to actually have no life on the fund have no liquidity pressure and actually go in and try to fund businesses saying that we want to fund you because we want to build businesses, not try to exit businesses, and never have any liquidity time pressure and have one of the very few permanent capital pools out there. But short-term versus long-termism is one of the greatest challenges I would say we face with microwave capitalism and value capture-oriented entrepreneurship as opposed to true value creation-oriented entrepreneurship. So let me wrap up with what we can do. What, is, what, what can you do if you want to practice leadership of goodness? There's five principles. First, imagine if leadership always went by the principle of be people first. Next time there's a hard decision to be made, don't ask, what does this do to my technology, to my funding, to my profit? What does this do to my people? Positive, negative, neutral. Second, a true commitment to help others become a fuller version of themselves. This is what mentorship truly is. It begins with a relationship and a commitment. Commit beyond competency to character and values of truth, compassion, and wholeness. Try to balance the realities. Have self-awareness that these five cognitive biases exist. And as Beth Comstock said, the greatest mark of a leader is being able to balance through those tensions. And ultimately, I think it's critical that we don't practice goodness 
just when we have an opportunity to avoid badness. This is what character has become. Character has become defined that it's in a moment where people aren't seeing you that I avoid being bad. Real goodness is doing goodness whenever we can. I'm going to wrap by showing you about 60 seconds of video of some of the conversations that we took on this journey and leave you with one thought challenge uh, and a call to action to be part of this mo movement. <laughs> We don't know if like justice and integrity and courage are actually things in this world. We, we don't know that, you know, but we have to live our lives as, as if they actually are, you know, and that if we live our lives as if this ideal of goodness and being good and maximizing human uh, health and well-being is an actual thing that we can do then perhaps that's the closest we come to attaining this abstraction that we call good, right? Good people means fairness, I think. It means treating people with uh, equity. Kindness, humility, um, empathy, compassion. Of course, the motivation for that is an open question. If you can help in any way, it's hard to not feel good about that. Who do you want to spend your time around? Are they going to suck energy from you or are they going to actually share life with you? I believe that when we're generous towards other human beings, we do it not only because we make them feel good, but also because it makes us feel good. And there's nothing wrong with that. We don't only have individual experience. All of our individual experience is based on a collective experience that we're all having together. Desire to do good desire to leave something positive and constructive and better than when I found it, right? Surpasses the broad use of the word legacy. I don't know that, that I or anybody can be whole without engaging in the very dangerous exercise of trying to love oneself and love other people. And love is not mush, you know, it's not hugs and butterflies and things like that. It's very serious business. Character is determined by how you treat someone the world says you could mistreat. You can at least change 10 people during your life. And if you change 10 people and make them better, and they in turn change 10 people and make them better, and they in turn change 10 people and make them better, it sounds audacious to say you can change the world. You can play a role. What would you like your contribution to be? So I just want to wrap up and close and um, thank you, but let's just go back one slide and leave you with this call to action. I've spent three years on this project and I'll continue over the next, as long as I can, on it, hopefully decades, and try putting thoughts towards a book. But none of that matters if we don't collectively participate in a movement of goodness. And what Henry McCann said at the end, if you each can think about your leadership, or you just for a moment break from your character, I'm not guest, you're not host, I'm not boss, you're not employee, you know, I'm not father and son. When we break from our character, we go human to human, and if you do that for 10 people, if each of us can just think of who will be the 10 people that we will positively imprint upon in our life, I think we will create a lot of goodness, and it's what leadership really needs now. Thank you. Thank you.